Coming to you live from downtown Detroit, this is Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep with your host, Joel Conan. This is a volatile puppy here, isn't it? And Dennis Dick. I've bitten a penny. I will buy the stock for a penny. With everything you need to start your trading day. Good morning, traders and investors. Welcome to this Monday edition of Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep, brought to you by Thinkorswim and TD Ameritrade. I'm Spencer Israel, here with Joel Elkanen and Dennis Dick. We got a full show for you folks this morning. Uh, Ron Abgenevenu will join us. Also, Jamie Wise, the founder of Buzz Indexes and the president and CEO of Periscope Capital. We're going to talk about this rally in the S&Ps. We think that Trump's interview in 16 Minutes may have had something to do with that. We're going to talk about the financials and how they're continuing to rally. NVIDIA's incredible move and DVAX's bad data. Joel, how was your weekend and how are we doing in the S&Ps this morning? Everything was uh, pretty good except for a uh, little Michigan mishap on uh, Saturday night. But that's all right. It still remains the same. we got to beat Ohio State. Uh, moving on here, S&P Futures did have a nice rally last night, 21, 74, 50. Uh, that just missed the all-time closing high at 21, 78. Gave it all back and traded down to 21, 58, just hanging out unchanged. We have crude trading down 61 cents. That was weak in the after hours on Friday. That continues. I do have some support, minor support here, right where it's trading. 42.68 is the current low. Uh, you did have a low at 42.61 on August 4th. Gold and silver continue to get the beats. We'll talk more about that when Dennis comes on. Real bad day on Friday. Actually, two bad days in a row. So we'll be keeping an eye on the metals. Maybe need a double bottom or something we can lean on before we get down and dirty on the long side. Dennis, how you doing on this Monday morning? Uh, feeling sick. I'm still fighting. Oh, this no. Here, and I don't know why. It just seems like every, wow, well, I know why. Because when you get two-year-old, they bring stuff home. When they go to daycare, then they come home, and they do bring sicknesses, too. I looked at, at daycare there, and there was five kids running around that were sick. So that happens. Nothing you can do about that. So fighting a cold. All right. But are you this fighting the market? That... Are you fighting the market like you did on Friday? Am I fighting it? Fighting the market. I'm always fighting the market, it seems like. But if you're fighting on any of these trends, though, these pesky trends that we continue to talk about, obviously the financials been so strong. You have other sectors that are so weak. I mean, the gun makers can't catch a break. The defensive stocks can't catch a break. TLT, it looks like it's going to be a rough morning. Again, probably for you utility stocks. you got TLT trading down a buck in the pre-market. you got the XLU trading down $0.28. Cents. So people must be banging their heads against the wall if they were buying any of these utility depths because it just has been relentlessly down the trend. I mean, DT Energy, since Trump has got in, has lost about 4 to 5% here. Southern's the same story here. Started up around 51 bucks, Trump's, and now it's 47.75 here in the pre market. Looking weak again here this morning. If you want to go over to the ones that are really, you know, a sector that's really been hit the hardest, which would be a shocker if you would say it, it's RGR and SWHC. The two gun makers have just been annihilated. Since Trump has got in, RGR was 65 bucks. It's now 47.50. Incredible here as the stock just continues. Every bounce, like we bounced a little bit Friday morning. By the end of the day, we're right here again. Every bounce just continues to get sold, and the bounces aren't very big. And I guess it's just a psychology that hey, you don't have to run out and buy a gun here with the Republican administration. And some of that, yeah. I mean, what else could it be? I mean, these things. Well, I'll tell you exactly what it is. It's the fact, and what we were talking about on Friday. It's when you get these continued moves that it's just annihilated everybody that's playing a market making or short term, you know, scalping, bouncing type capacity. And when you see the moves this straight down, and I know you can say, oh, well, we bounced two and a half dollars Friday morning. Well, that, you know, is very small when you consider that we had just fallen $65 and we fell 16 straight points, basically, with the, you know, the best we had was a dollar or two bounce all the way down. I mean, we talked about on Friday the 56 move to the 49 move. Moves like that blow market makers away and nobody wants to bid those things. And, you know, so obviously, you know, then you get a bounce, you get people that are caught. 
and then they're selling the hell out of it again. And then, you know, all of a sudden it starts taking out the lows and everybody says, here we go again. You get the momentum traders banging down on it too. So a lot of this just has to do with more market structure, more uh, technical analysis, as opposed to these gun makers, you know, in big trouble because Trump is in. All right, we got a lot of movers to cover. <clears throat> SWHC. I just want to talk that one there, too, because obviously $28 to $21. These are just unbelievable moves. And there's so many people that keep asking me, especially on some of these other stocks, even like AT&T and Verizon here, they're asking, you know, well, the bottom's got to be coming soon here. And, and, and yeah, maybe it is coming soon, but I don't know where that price is going to be. Like these things, these pesky trends just continue here. And AT&T really hasn't even got hit that hard since Trump got in. It looks like, yeah, it's, look at this AT&T setup here, 36.30. 36.27, 36.40, yesterday's low, or Friday's low, 36.30. That starts taking out 36.20, 36.10. That is a breakdown, again, for AT&T. So I know you can say, wow, it's got a 5.37% dividend. Where can it go? People just don't want to own these stocks right now. That's the biggest issue here. And when momentum starts going in the one direction, we know how hard it is to turn it. The exact opposite way here this morning is, you know, the financials. And I said it, you know, we, were, we, we had a great talk there with a couple guys from our chat. Brad, who's uh, FLAK UK in the chat, and Phil, uh, uh, Phil there from the chat as well. Uh, they came into Detroit. We talked with them, you know, on Saturday, uh, Friday. Well, you were talking Friday, and I was with them Saturday as well. And we were just you know, talking about these pesky trends, and we were saying, you know, Bank America, um, 1902 is where it closed. I mean, it's 1924 here this morning. Here's the market, only up a couple of points, but your financials, Bank America is up another 1.2% here this morning. You start to ask yourself, I mean, is this thing going to see 20 bucks? Like, yeah. I mean, you start logically thinking about this because it seems like every time it takes out a whole number, 19, it goes to the next whole number, pauses there for a couple hours, and then takes it out. I mean, this was $16 a week ago. This is, you know, a huge move for a huge company. Two things here, Dennis. Number one, people are asking you about, you know, those, uh, those uh, gun stocks is, you know, where's the bottom? What's your time frame, right? You know, if you're playing this, you know, short term, you know, you need some kind of technical formation. Long term, I mean, the fundamentals have to change maybe for earnings again. So a lot of it is where's your time frame? And I personally have to thank you for uh, your lecture on Bank of America. I ditched uh, my uh, uh, some puts that I was holding on that, hoping for a pullback that was just so strong on Friday. Just spoo's getting killed, and I'm looking at this thing. It struggled to even go red on the day. Close strong. I have to agree. Thank you. Uh, thank you on that one. I didn't have the guts to do the old revenge trade and turn and go long it, but uh, strong move here in the financials and, uh, you know, it's straight up. It's not even a strong move. It's like it's like and, and, and Friday was a little bit different story. But here Bank America pull back 60, 70 cents and you think, OK, well, here it is. Here's the pullback. No, two hours later, the thing's back green. I mean, these things just have relentless buying pressure right now. And, you know, the reason for that is everybody's run over. You know, if you were shorting the thing, trying to call the top, it pulls back in a little bit. You're like, thank you. You know, give me some cover here. Because when they go get going in the one direction right now, these trends are absolutely relentless. I'm none better than the video on Friday. Like, that was unbelievable move. I mean, it was a great quarter. Don't kid yourself. And I said on the show, I got run over in the stock, trading the stock after hours. And I'm looking back in hindsight, and that was probably one of my best trades in a long time. You say, how's that your best trade? Losing, you know, three or four points on a stock on an earnings, you know, call there. You know, that sounds like you don't know what the hell you're doing. But, I mean, I blew it out at 77. So I started showing 72, 73. I was dead wrong. But I didn't hold. I didn't continue to hold. You know, I wish I would have been able to get out better. I got out some of the positions, 74, 75. It was just really fast. I mean, we're talking about a trade that happened in less than five or ten minutes. And, you know, I had a, the wrong opinion, the wrong call. I thought that they were going to fade the tech bounce because they had been hitting tech stocks. And this report was just too strong. And the momentum traders start coming in, and boom, you know, on Friday. And so I covered after hours Thursday at 77. The thing's at 78, 79, 80, 180, 82, 83, 84, 45. In the first 20 minutes of trading, it blew out through another seven handles. Closes up near the highs at 87.97, up 30% on the day. Man, Merry Christmas if you're long this stock. Are these moves sustainable, though? 
Ah, uh, well, you can't stand in front of it right now just using the, the stock NVIDIA from a pre-market and after hours perspective. Uh, you know, we talk about using the levels and whatnot. Uh, Dennis, you were obviously, you know, shorting it a little bit early, but the thing that was really impressive here. Everybody is, was shorting yeah. it early if they shorted it all on Friday. <laughs> Uh, that if you took out, uh, you know, you try and use some of these parameters and uh, if you look at where something is trading in the pre-market or after hours and it continues through that area, I mean, even after the open on that, you could have still caught it on the long side. Uh, you did have a pre-market high. Let's see, going back here. Uh, it was like in the 70s, 880 area, opened up right there, and then never even looked back. Your opening print on Friday was 79.51. You did have a dip to 78.50, but that's one of those scenarios where if you buy it coming back up through the open that, uh, that um, coincided with the pre-market high there, it was uh, a pretty easy move uh, in retrospect. Yeah, well, unbelievable, though. It's just a continuation of those moves there. And Linda in the chat is asking me if some of the big tech stocks will come back. Like, some of the big tech stocks have been killed here or, or you know, beat up substantially there. They did bounce back on Friday, even talking, you know, like Fang, looking at that, your Facebook, Amazon. I mean, there was a washout on Thursday where, you know, that Facebook we talked about, you know, they hit that straight down nine points Facebook on Thursday. Had a nice little inside day on Friday, but. These stocks here, there's still people that are wishy-washy on them. Now they're up a lot of money in these things. They're not participating in the recent rally. of have a lot of stocks breaking out to new highs, but these are going the opposite direction. Amazon, a little inside day there too, bouncing back a bit, but higher multiple stocks. They're not really – and just keep going through Google and obviously the last one, Netflix. I mean – this, you know, and even the Netflix chart, actually Netflix made me low on the move on Friday. I mean, this is not really, you know, the, the type of stock that I think that a Trump regime is going to help. But, you know, just thinking, you know, not even from the fundamentals or macro perspectives here, things have just, you know, been strong for a long period of time and they have turned weak technically here. So bounces, you know, once they've broken down through levels are to be sold. I mean, Netflix ever gets back up to 120, I think it's going to run into a barrage of sellers. So just like, you know, some of these stocks are relentlessly up, some of these tech stocks, you know, some of these bigger ones look like, you know, besides NVIDIA, which is just unbelievable the other way, um, look like, you know, they, they're going to run into resistance if they do start bouncing. So I think the trend might be down on some of these other stocks. So it continues. Some stocks going up, some stocks going down in this new Trump market. And uh, just uh, b uh, Bob Wire, we looked at IEP lately, and uh, that is finally after just getting beat up for the last couple of years. That's had a great move off the Trump presidency as well here. Um, 55, that there's a stock that's had a three-day move going from uh, 46 and change up to nearly 55. So, man, if you're thinking of shorting this one, you just got to think about, Hard. boom. Yeah, look at that. Long time and, coming down. Maybe it's finally uh, turned the corner. Well, a couple things on this. First, you know, I always say look at the NAV, and I don't know what it was, but, you know, when we looked at it like three or four months ago when we looked at it, it was down around 32 or 33 bucks. So you're paying a huge premium to be along board with Icon. People want to do that right now. I mean, Icon is friends with Trump. We know that. It's, the, it's not going to hurt them that the next president is going to be one of your buddies. So, you know, maybe that, you know, I don't know if that can help his company or not, but people are banking on it. And that's why you're seeing there's no other reason you're seeing I IEP go from 46, you know, to fifty four dollars and forty one cents. Not like, you know, all of a sudden Icon just turned everything around here, but it's going to help that the next president, one of his buddies there. So that's why it's a Trump stock, too, at least in the short term. Long term, are these sustainable? I don't think so, but I don't know where the turn starts. I don't know if this thing could go to 60. I mean, if you were just looking rationally, looking back at the Bank of America, going from 17 to 18, you're like, that's a pretty good move. Now it's 19 and a quarter. So you can't stand in the way of these freight trains when they start going in one direction. you got to wait till you get a solid turn. Maybe, you know, like you said, put in a double top or put in something that you can lean on because if you're just randomly shorting, you know, trying to pick the top, you could be really wrong and you could lose a lot of money doing that. So not my, my, my game here to just call the top. Because a lot of people are trying to do that. A lot of people are losing money doing it. Uh, looks like a little pop to 27.80 and X. There's another stock that had to gap a go and really hasn't given anything back. What, what's that? X, U.S. Steel. Oh, and X, U.S. Steel. Yeah. The, uh, oh, I know. Unbelievable. Well, you know, wall, whatever you want to say. Steel stocks, you know, and the metals here. Well, anything that's going to be doing to do with anything building here has really taken off since Trump got in.
All right, it is now 8.15. We're going to take our first break of the morning and bring in our first guest, Jamie Wise, founder of Buzz Indexes and president and CEO of Periscope Capital. We'll be right back with Jamie. Whether you're a short-term swing trader or a long-term investor, you need to check out Thinkorswim, brought to you by TD Ameritrade. There's a reason why Thinkorswim has been named the number one trading platform, because it has it all. With Thinkorswim, you can trade stocks, options, futures, forex, and virtually every other type of order. Get notifications on mobile devices and interact with other traders in chat rooms. You can also use technical indicators and see the latest investing and trading education in Think Money magazine. If you want to keep up with the markets, you need Thinkorswim. To experience everything Thinkorswim has to offer, open a TD Ameritrade account today. Thinkorswim, the online trading platform for traders and investors. TD Ameritrade, member SIPC. All investing involves risks. Welcome back, traders and investors, to Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep, brought to you by Thinkorswim. I'm Spencer Israel, here with Joel Elkanen and Dennis Dick, and we're on the line with Jamie Wise. He is the founder of Buzz Indexes and the president and CEO of Periscope Capital. Jamie, thanks for coming on, and how are you doing on this Monday morning? Hey, doing good so far. Thanks for having me on the show, and looking forward to the discussion. We have some super crisp audio on this call. I'm really digging it. All right. Uh, so, yeah, tell us a little bit about Buzz Indexes. Uh, and what exactly uh, it is and how it works. Sure. So the Buzz Indexes actually licensed its first product, the Buzz Social Media Insights Index, to NYSE listed ticker symbol BUZ, which is an ETF, which is the world's first ETF to bring social sentiment oriented investment strategies to the broader investment community. We listen to what everyone is saying about stocks, millions of you, people on the call today, all of their conversations and insights and identify the most positively talked about stocks across all of the broad social media forums. We wrap it all up in an index and deliver exposure to the top 75 most positively discussed. Jamie? Yeah, can you hear me? Okay, still got you. Cool. So 75, uh, cut off right after, after you said 75, we got 75 stocks with the most positive uh, social sentiment. So what what's in the index right now? Okay, so in the index right now, if we think about sector allocations, we're overweight, what you would expect, tech, consumer discretionary, and this one's really exciting, is healthcare, biotech stocks. So this is a great example, and, and we saw this in the recent election, where you know polls were generally wrong about how it would play out, but online, if you measured the sentiment towards Trump, it was a much closer race, or even had him out front. And we think that was even reflected within the investment community. Even though biotech stocks were selling off going into the election, they were positively discussed online, made it into our index, and, and since the election have really, as you, as you all know, performed just unbelievably. Uh, so aside from, aside from the healthcare uh, sector, what, like, what changes ha did you see uh, leading up to and since the election? Sure. So we last we rebalance the index every month on the third Thursday. So in the last rebalance, which was a month ago in the middle of October, we saw a couple of uh, maybe about 10 or so names come into the index and, and 10 or so go out. Two names that came in, which were really interesting for us, were NVIDIA and AMD. Right. And we're trying to understand why those names might be coming into the index. Clearly, the stocks have performed well. So they're price momentum type stocks. We know NVIDIA really well here because we use their graphic processors to help power our algorithms and engines, which can analyze and understand all those millions of conversations. So we know the power of NVIDIA's business model and how those gaming processors have really uh, sort of transcended into the AI and big data machine learning tech uh, sort of environment and people are using them to power all of those insights that you're reading about in you know in newspapers or in academic research and they made it into the index last night and uh, last month and, and wow was that timely as we were just talking about and NVIDIA had the huge earnings speed a couple of days ago. A uh, question here from our chat, how do you rebalance and does that add to uh, management costs? 
Sure. So we rebalance once a month. We focus on the 75 most talked about names. Uh, like we said, typically we see about 10 names rebalance within the index each month. We only focus on large cap US stocks, 5 billion market cap and over. And we have a max weight in the index of 3%. And the index is actually weighted according to sentiment. So the more positively discussed stock, the more the higher the weight it'll have in the index. And, and what are the, the stocks with the highest weight? right now okay so right now we've got nvidia obviously is number one post rebalance we have amd apple twitter's in the index google tesla valiant disney those are the highest weights that we have and we have gilead amazon those are all three percent weights in the index Abishai. so how uh so you you license the index uh to to the buzz uh etf but do you also license it to, to hedge funds? Uh, you have a hedge fund background. Uh, so we do. We, we, we do have a hedge fund background, and we purposely don't license our data out to hedge funds. When, when we first started this process three or four years ago and looking at insights that we can find from, from social discussions, we made a decision then that you know, instead of bringing it within our traditional hedge fund format, we really wanted to make this data accessible, right? We were well aware that some of the largest hedge funds, you know, Two Sigma or Renaissance, were, were definitely using these types of data points and insights in their quantitative strategies. We could even see in the last year or two that Bloomberg and Thomson Reuters, even TD Ameritrade were providing social insights to their customers, but no one was really making it accessible and no one was really providing an investment solution where you have 5,000 stocks that people are talking about and you can think about insights for all of them. How do you actually build a portfolio that can benefit from the most positive insights and how do you manage that and how do you structure that? And that's a difficult problem for a lot of investors. And we want to be able to allow investors to access social sentiment, access social momentum. And the easiest way for us to do that was to deliver it through an ETF. So, so we put all of our data out there to the public. You can go on our website at buzzindexes.com, sign up, and you can get free insights on, on what we're seeing trending across social. Chat is buzzing right now with some questions. I'm going to read off a couple for you right now. I, I guess one question, and this is, speaks to what you just answered, but how, how do you use, how do we, how do retail traders and investors use this information and see what's in sure. the index and how do they use the information? Well, I, we think the easiest way to use it is just to go out and get exposure to the Buzz ETF because, like I mentioned, and, and this came early on in our research, when you have people talking about 5,000 stocks, what really matters is the depth of that conversation. So you can imagine it's pretty different, the insights you can receive, whether 50 people are talking about a stock or 50,000. And the more people talking about a stock, the more confidence you can have in what is being said is truly reflective of the average opinion and, and will be represented in stock prices. So when we create the index, the first thing we do with that list of 5,000 stocks is we only look at the large cap equities. We want to ignore, you know, penny stocks or, or sort of stocks that could be manipulated in chat rooms or, or message boards. So focusing on large cap stocks allows us to do that. And then, you know, secondary, we focus on the most talked about stocks. So if 50 people are talking about a stock and it's really positive, that doesn't matter to us. And that's important because you might not understand that insight just looking at a social score on your TD Ameritrade account. But we distill all that information, we screen for it, we look for the most talked about stocks so we have that confidence. And then from there, we can score the sentiment and rank the index. How long has, has this been around for? So the, the ETF launched in April of 2016. Um, we started the Buzz project here at Periscope three or four years ago, uh, building out the algorithms and thinking about how to position this and bring this to market, uh, and excited to launch ticker symbol BUZ, uh, NYSE listed, back in April. So in that it's been time, around for six months. So in that time, have you seen a correlation between uh, social sentiment and, and price? We sure have. I and mean, we look at how the index has performed you know, over the last six months, ending on Friday, it's done amazing. It's beaten the S&P by uh, three and a half, three and three quarter percent. And more importantly, I think we've outperformed the MTUM ETF, which is a pure price momentum ETF. And a lot of people think of us as a price momentum strategy, but there's really more to it than social insights, right? When you think about 
how people talk about stocks positively online or why they might be talking about them. NVIDIA is a great example. It's a price momentum stock. It's been going up. People are excited about the story. But we also see names in the index like, like Twitter, for example, right? Where Twitter is clearly not a price momentum stock, hasn't been in the index every single month, but it's in there now because people see value in that company. People see value in the platform. So they talk about that stock from that perspective online, even though it's not a price momentum security. So you get a bit of a barbell approach in the buzz ETF where you hold some price momentum securities and you also hold some value stocks. And uh, where do you get the data from? How many social social feeds are you, are you guys watching? Sure. We're, we're looking and listening to everywhere and anywhere people might be talking about stocks. So of course that could be, you know, Twitter and platforms like that, but that links to a whole number of blog sites, stock dedicated forums. Think about comment sections from news articles. If people on Benzinga are talking about stocks, uh, whether it's in response to an article or in a chat room, there's a good chance we're listening to it and harnessing all of that data for our insights. We're on the line with Jamie Wise. He's the founder of Buzz Indexes and president and CEO of Periscope Capital. I think a familiar question uh, that we get when uh, we talk to you know people that are involved in this aspect of the industry is like, who do you choose to follow? I mean, there's a lot of noise out there in social media. How do you, you know how do you choose to follow? How do you also you know you know uh, prevent against the people that are saying things because they have a position you know the familiar pump and dump how how do you sure. how do you deal with those issues that that's a great question and a natural question that comes up and and our view is that the data that we collect from social media really you know the social media environment is the ideal environment and platform for analyzing and interpreting sort of good collective group decision making, right? And there's a reason why that is. You have a huge diversity of opinion on social media. Ideas are independent, that's very important. So that's a separate concept to polling. No one is asking people online what they view or what their view is of a, rel of a you know, specific stock. People are offering that independently. You have a wide diversity of participants, a lot of people telling, and you have a really high incentive for truth telling. And I know you mentioned the pump and dump kind of risk. But in reality, people are online and they're talking about things they're doing or about to do in the stock market, right? There's, they want to you know, acquire influence online. They want to be validated. So they're likely telling the truth. Of course, we can guard against bad actors, and we do it in a number of different ways. You know, the first thing is focusing on large cap U.S. equities. It's much more difficult for someone online to manipulate the price of Disney than it would be some very small cap stock. And the other thing is we can identify spam. If someone is using a bot program to try and you know, put out a million social tweets about buying some company, it's pretty easy today to identify that as spam the same way that in your email you know, we used to be worried about would email exist 20 years ago because your inbox would be filled with spam. Well, now the spam filters are really advanced and can identify spam before it even gets into the algorithm. And and we'll use some of those same techniques here at Buzz to make sure that the data that we're analyzing is is accurate data and they're real people saying it. One final question uh, preceding the election. Did you see any? I mean, you had this huge sector rotation. Uh, did you kind of see? I looked at the coal ETF. I mean, that thing was just a monster. Like, people were buying that, but like 100% sure Trump was getting in here. Did you see anything that probably would have tipped you off here as far as sector rotation ahead of the election? Yeah, to us, it was the biotech exposure in the portfolio. And, and to see that exposure stay consistent or even be building in the weeks and months leading into the election told us that all of the fears of, of Hillary coming in and shutting down that sector and just destroying their earnings profitability, that wasn't as prevalent um, sort of on the big group discussion as it was maybe in the broader financial press. People were still constructive on biotechs. They were certainly constructive about their earning power. And the fact that they were still buying them and talking positively about them, I think, reflected that, in fact, Trump was winning. Um, but he was winning on social, and he wasn't winning in the mainstream press. And, and we were able to pick up on that. And uh, any options trading yet on Buzz or just the straight ETF? Right now, it's just the straight ETF, and you know, if you follow us at Buzz Indexes on on Twitter, or follow us, or sign up for our, our you know free reports, as soon as options get listed, we'll be sure to share that.
Great. We've been on the line with Jamie Wise. He's the founder of Buzz Indexes and president and CEO of Periscope Capital. Jamie, great information. We'll have to get you on again soon and uh, see what trade uh, changes there are in the Buzz Index. You got it. Thanks for having me. All right, 8.30, uh, S&P still up a buck and a quarter. Crude getting a little bounce, not much change in the gold and the silver market. We'll bring Dennis back in here and uh, cover some stocks. Let's just look here on balances. 8.30 just came out. Continuation theme here happening. I'm seeing a little bit of strength in the financials. Coca-Cola, this is just doing a standout here. It's a big sell order, 267000 to sell. You can see right as that imbalance information came out at 8.30, stock was trading flat. Now they've started hitting here again because obviously some big institution says, look, get me out. They don't care if Coke's, you know, was $43 and Trump came. It's 41 here now. They're selling those kind of stocks here. And you can see here this morning, Coke actually getting hit once again here. Well, actually, it's just was bouncing around now. I don't, Whoa, what was that? Going, some I don't know what's going on here. We got some news on Coca-Cola. Boy, that was a big move there. Just trying. This to... weird. I'm just watching. It's just trading all over the place. Forty-one forty. We right got right news now. on. Just Coca -Cola. as I'm saying, it was started getting hit. Now it's actually getting bought. Yeah. Like big. Oh, time. forty-one sixty. Looking, we got I'm something looking. in Coca-Cola. Come on, guys, get something for me here. We'll get it from our trusty news. Forty-one eighty-five. That's just a buck move, Dan. Oh, back down. Forty-one eleven. This all over the place. This almost looks like a bad algo or something, but I'm not sure if that's the case. Uh, Could be news here, too. It's all over the place. It's interesting to watch. Anything else doing this? See anything else? Uh, this Jumping up? Pepsi's not. I'm just trying to see some of the defensive ones. I That's weird trading here right now, but let me just go look, too. We're all go hunting for Coke. Chat, hunt for Coke here, too, because it's moving around here right now I mean, uh, article, quite actively. I mean, article uh, about Budweiser and Coke being a good match, but I'm not seeing anything. I don't see much either, either. That's an incredible move here for Coke, though, so... From going from 41, nobody's interested, and they're buying it. They're buying this up. So something's happening with Coke right now, 41 and a half. Careful if you're trading it. We're still trying to find out what the news is. 41, 49, 41, 54. It looks weird, though. Did like, that it's imbalance? Just trading. Did, did the imbalance flip? It's still 267000 to sell. You know what? It's, like, uh -oh. it's the reverse revenge algo trade that now sees a sell imbalance. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting one here. You know, I'm tempted to short the thing, but I don't know what the news is. And you always get in trouble when you start shorting something you don't know what the news is. Yeah, well, <laughs> Big move up for Coke here, though. Um, if you've been getting hit the last couple of days, it's a nice bounce. You know, just not knowing the news here on a stock like this, I automatically think that, hey, maybe, you know, this is, you know, a good bounce to sell. But we need to know what the news is. That's the one thing I will say in all my years of trading. When you just try to trade something and you don't know what the news is, you're usually the uninformed trader. And you usually lose money. So I always like to know what the news is. Then, you know, obviously make your trading decision once you know what all the information is out there. Because for some reason here right now, they are buying Coke. And it's up substantially here in the free market. Up hey, uh, one three nine percent Yeah, nice move there in Coca-Cola. Um, what else do we have for uh, imbalances? Anything else? Uh, Bank of America, 100000 to buy. Alibaba, 248000 to buy here. Um, that's going the opposite direction again. You know, I was just, you know, this is, you know, the trend has been down for Alibaba here ever since uh, Trump got in. So it makes me think that Alibaba, you know, if you do get a big bounce, and I think you're going to find sellers again. So, you know, it's Coke's the same story. We're getting a good bounce here this morning, but unless the news is a game changer, it's probably going to be some people who are willing to come in and, you know, take some profits or, you know, cut losses from the last few days here. So Coke really bouncing around here still, though. So Alibaba, though, quick, quick technicals on that one, Joel. Alibaba, I think a lot of people got caught in this one. You know, oh, the singles day, it's going to rally, you know, record yeah. sales and no way. Again. Yeah. Uh, trading up in a pre-market a little bit here, not much. 94.09, that was a high from yesterday. Hasn't taken that level out. Between Got the close from Thursday just above that. Then you open up to a double top at 98.50 area. But right now, you know, can't even get excited about this thing until it clears 94. I mean, trading crowded trades. I have made a lot of money over my 17-year career by trying to figure out what side, you know, the crowd is on and going the opposite way. I call it, the, you know, the herd mentality. When everybody on the street is talking about something, the market will almost always do the opposite. So there is a lot of strategies to be had by figuring out which trades are crowded and then go in the opposite direction there. So and Alibaba is a great call on your part there saying singles day. A lot of people thinking, oh, it's going to be really good. All the singles numbers are coming in good. Well, the trade was already you know kind of crowded 
to that side. And then, obviously, you know, um, just with the overall trend, but not Alibaba being down since Trump had got in, it might have gave you a little bit of a bounce there on Thursday night. And then, you know, they came in selling the news on Friday. Yeah, some of the Chinese stocks as well. All right, Des, we'll let you go uh, banging that keyboard a little bit more. I gotta go. I gotta find out Coke. I'm going digging, so I'll pick you. I'll I, be back I, with you. I, I, I think it's Budweiser and, and Coke. Uh, something's going on there. All right, let's uh, go to digging. let's go to Ron Bienvenue, managing member of Spear Point Capital Management. We'll be right back with Ron. Whether you're a short-term swing trader or a long-term investor, you need to check out Thinkorswim, brought to you by TD Ameritrade. There's a reason why Thinkorswim has been named the number one trading platform, because it has it all. With Thinkorswim, you can trade stocks, options, futures, forex, and virtually every other type of order. Get notifications on mobile devices and interact with other traders in chat rooms. You can also use technical indicators and see the latest investing and trading education in Think Money magazine. If you want to keep up with the markets, you need Thinkorswim. To experience everything Thinkorswim has to offer, open a TD Ameritrade account today. Thinkorswim, the online trading platform for traders and investors. TD Ameritrade, member SIPC. All investing involves risks. Welcome back, traders and investors, to Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep, brought to you by Benzinga Pro. I'm your co-host, Joel Alconin, along with Dennis Dick and Spencer Israel. We're hunting down Mr. Bienvenue right now. We're going to bring Dennis back in, and we did get some information on that Coca-Cola. Yeah, it does look like there was a Telegraph article from the UK over the weekend that Budweiser and Coke here, uh, the, it's titled A Match Brewed in Heaven. Um, this was just mentioned here on CNBC as well, so attention being brought to the mass media on this now. So I think that was the reason here for the Coke pop. Again, this is just rumors here. We don't know anything, you know, if there's anything to this or not. But that's, you know, why, you know, Coke is suddenly getting a pop. If we look at Budweiser, BUD, it's actually trading down substantially here in the pre-market. So the trend continues to go down here for Bud. But that's your news there on Coke here. It's trading up a little bit in the pre-market. I look at this and, you know, a lot of these moves, you know, a lot of these rumors here, you know, don't materialize. Especially, I don't know if they're, if they're insinuating that there's going to be a takeover of Coke. I don't think that's the case, but maybe, you know, some type of merger of equals. I haven't read the article. It just got thrown on my screen here. And obviously, I'm on the radio show, so I don't have time to read it. But the title is Budweiser and Coke, A Match Brewed in Heaven. I can throw that article in the chat here right now if you want to take a quick look at it. But it does look like that is the reason for the Coca-Cola pop here this morning. Trading up 1% in the pre market. Tons of other stocks here, though, Joel, to talk about. I mean, there's huge moves. But you know what I found interesting here? You had a couple of retailers, and the retailers are back in favor here, too. Um, you know, we've talked a lot, and we've given a lot of love to the banks, we've given a lot of love to the drugs. We've given a lot of hate to some of the utilities and some of the other stocks, but we haven't talked that much about the retailers. I mean, Kohl's has, you know, and it was earnings related here, too, but KSS was 45 bucks three days ago. It's now 53. JWN had a great report there, too. It's trading up, you know, about nine points since Trump got in here, or almost 20%, which is an impressive move as well. But what I found interesting was Dillard's and both J.C. Penney disappointed the street on Friday. Both of those stocks were trading down in the pre-market, yet... Both of those stocks turned around, reversed, and closed substantially higher. Like, bring up DDS. If you look at the Friday action, that stock was trading down the pre-market at 63 64 bucks, And it turned around on a dime, and they bought it hard. It closed all the way back up at the highs. So even despite, you know, a disappointing report there from Dillard's, 
They didn't care about that. They just cared that they were coming in here and buying all the retailers, and they came in buying the dip on a couple of those big box retailers, including J.C. Penney as well. Keep an eye on the $72 level in Dillard's, your two-day high, 72.32. Friday's high, 71.65. So split those, 72 even. Psychological lever could come into play. I did see J.C. Penney trading lower here uh, on Friday. Boy, they bought that up. Under $8. I mean, it hadn't been under 8 in a while. I mean, shorts eventually have to cover sometime. I think you also had some uh, daily support in that area. That was uh, actually, you got under 8. That was on Wednesday. That was brief. Uh, challenge 950 here. Uh, nice move of JCPenney. Let's see if it can continue and break out above 950. Uh, just other stocks here that were on my list to talk about. Fitbit, F-I-T, which was interesting there. It got hit a little bit, but the last three days slowly starting to try to climb back here. It's just interesting from a tactical standpoint because they had three lows right around the 830, and then he kind of broke out there on Thursday. 840 was the low, got up to 927, and then continuing there at 922. So two highs right in the same area. What do you think about this Fitbit chart as it tries to find some buyers? I mean, there is some buy-the-dip mentality in some stocks. Well, I, I want to say on Thursday, that breakout was due to a false file, a fake filing. Um, the, uh, from the, a fake filing that got snuck into the SEC. Actually, the news desk was all over the story. I've been seeing it, but there was a fake filing. What was the filing? What did they say? Uh, it was it an up. offer from ABM Capital. Um, like a takeover off yeah of yeah fake and, one. and it was it was nonsense and so we were able to get get word from from the SEC and from Fitbit that it was it was all total nonsense bogus yep bogus interesting though it sold back off afterwards and then it's actually been bought right back up here again so people just coming in here I mean it's hard to value you know the people it's trying to find its home here you had a disappointing earnings report people are wondering if this is you know a one trick pony this is a fad and it's over and that's what we've you know said on a long time on the show that we think it might be the case but you know other people think you know this thing still makes some money here or actually I guess last quarter lost some money but you know it did have a great product there for a while can they come out with something else can they not be a one trick pony there and I mean if they can figure out something else then you know there's some crazy you know value to the stock, but I don't know if they're going to be able to do that. That's why Fitbit here actually just as I'm speaking here, it just takes off too, goes from 9:32 up to 9:39. So somebody's excited here this morning. But anyways, uh, it's just it's just popped a percent here while I was talking about it. All right, Dennis, uh, going back to the chat here, uh, thankfulness uh, has a question for us, and can we talk about reverse splits? Uh, sure. Is there a specific stock, though, that we wanted to look at here? Because my thought on reverse splits is they're obviously terrible for shareholders. I mean, we can think about Alcoa. Alcoa is a little confusing because it did the spinoff and everything with uh, the ARCN afterwards, or AR, I can't even remember what the ticker symbol is on the other one. But um, they did, I think that's right, actually, ARC. It's Archon, anyways. They did the spinoff. I can't even remember what the ticker symbol is on it. But when you do a reverse split, obviously, you know, and you talk these sometimes one for ten or, th or or one for three, your you know your shareholders are losing a ton of stock. So the Alcoa was at ten dollars. Does the reverse split goes up to it's supposed to go up to thirty, um, and it's you know and if I you know if you have you know, hundred shares or if you had three hundred shares now you're only gonna have one hundred shares. So you know theoretically here you're still at the same price. But what I typically find is the stocks that seem to do reverse splits are companies that want to get their price higher and they can't do it the old-fashioned way by improving earnings and improving company fundamentals so they reverse split the stock and I find that they just deteriorate further again so I'm not a fan of reverse splits at all and I also think when companies are doing that it's more of an issue that the company has issues so it's kind of a red flag for me when a company's doing reverse splits because that means they can't get the price up on their own they obviously don't see you know them driving fundamentals to get the price up on their own in the near future and that's why they're doing the reverse split some of them just do it to just keep trading on the exchange because exchange has rules. If certain prices aren't are breached for certain periods of time, then obviously you know they have to delist them too. So lots of reasons, lots of negative reasons for reverse splits, and it's more of a sign of a of a company that is having some struggles. Yeah, I mean you take a, a Citigroup as an example, an all-time high of five ninety-one point two five. 
Uh, did go down to 970 back up in the $50 area, but uh, really in comparison, I mean, it just, you know, far, far from ever reaching uh, the levels that previous uh, previous highs in 2000. Uh, another question here coming out of the chat, Dennis, uh, was uh, regarding retail stocks. Uh, they're asking if we have a particular system that we follow to uh, not lose track of the laggers retailers, you know, June, July, when they kind of, I think for me, me it's just kind of you know rolling through the charts and keeping an eye on the you know group of stocks that i do do you have a particular system or alert system you use for that i look at the main ones so i've got on my screen i have about 200 stocks and i have it broken up into sectors and i put the main ones on the screen so when i just look you know relatively i can look at my screen i see oh i see right in the corner here this morning i see all the financials trading green so i know that's a relatively strong sector i can look right away and see all, all the miners are trading red it just jumps right out i can see all the utilities are trading red here this morning jumps right out at me here so you know i have the main ones on the screens so the ones that i like to trade the ones you know the bigger ones in the sector like your nikes your Kohl's, your home depots your lows um you know and obviously you know amazon is the biggest but amazon is its own animal so i don't group amazon in with Kohl's, and even though it's obviously a retailer it makes sense you know from a fundamental standpoint that you'd say you would group it in i you know the other ones are more traditional retailers amazon is online it's kind of its own world so I think of Amazon, you know, as its own company, not really as, you know, part of this whole retail sector, even though it's it's the biggest component in most of your retail indexes here. So, but just because I see Amazon going up doesn't mean I think other retail stocks are going to go up because there isn't as high correlation as there is between a Kohl's and a JWN and a Macy's as there is with an Amazon and a Kohl's. So I have them on my screen. I'm just watching them. And, you know, really, you know, and like this is why we do the pre-market show uh, because what is strong in the pre-market often continues into the regular session there. So and you can get tells from the pre-markets like playing poker you're looking for the most information possible and the best information you can extract at you know 846 in the morning is looking where the prices are trading in the pre-market and what looks strong and what looks weak because that can give you tells into other stocks in the sector and this morning i'm seeing retail strong i mean you have some upgrades here this morning too if i'm just looking you know to the upgrades and downgrades you had citigroup which you know upgraded Coles this morning they also upgraded al brands both of those stocks are trading higher in the pre-market but even looking at the other stocks in the sector most of your retail stocks here this morning are looking relatively strong compared to the overall market. All right, real quick, thankfulness. Uh, just going back to the reverse split thing, more volatility on the first day because of the new pricing. Yeah, because there's just less of a book in there. There's less paper. People are readjusting after the reverse split. Also, institutions that um, you know are in it need to readjust their positions. They're probably not throwing out a lot of orders you know, uh, on the first or second day of trading. They're trying to let it, uh, let it simmer uh, again, readjust their position, see how it is in their portfolio. Uh, did we have another question in here, Dennis? There's a few popping in here. So, oh, um, just uh, on the Coke in the, uh, the InBev, uh, you know, does, uh, someone asked if Coke has any alcoholic beverages. I do not, but uh, they're talking about perhaps uh, some regulatory issues regarding the uh, – Budweiser and Coca-Cola. I mean, talking regular, we're, we're, we're really, you know, getting ahead of ourselves here. Do I even think Coke and Budweiser, you know, maybe they're going to do some type of collaboration. I don't think there's going to be a merger here. I mean, Telegraph's good paper over in the UK, but I don't think you're going to see Coke and Budweiser merge. I just don't think it's going to happen. Um, it's not Coca-Cola style really either to join up with a big, you know, their style more would be to buy smaller companies there. Budweiser's absolutely enormous. So um, I think it could be more of a collaboration as opposed to if there is something even there. So obviously it's just rumors here right now. So I'm not even talk about any trust or anything like that. We're way too early to be thinking about that. I don't even know if there's anything to this. Coke has come down substantially from where it hit in the pre-market. It was up to 4180. It's only at 4143 here right now. If I look at the imbalance here this morning, it hasn't really grown. It's now 272,000 to sell. So it's telling me that you know it could come in even farther if you know that imbalance holds now it's already traded 172,000 shares so coke probably opens higher here but matter of whether people come in and fade this pop because they're probably underwater from the last three days don 33 what's happening with the biotech going forward well we wish we had the answer to that i just for for me that 300 sticks out in the biotech index it got up there 
quite a few times over the last uh, several weeks and has failed there miserably. Still hasn't got there, but that's the kind of formation you go, you'd really like to see uh, highs in July there. He hit it again in August, got up there again in September, failed every time at that level. Uh, $300 just for overall for the IBB. Uh, we'd have to look at some individual stocks. But to me, nice round number, huge level. Uh, that, to me, would confirm another leg up in the IBB. Only a few minutes here. Uh, just want to jump into a few things here. First of all, did you guys watch 60 Minutes last night? Because Trump was on 60 Minutes. And I, it was interesting here. Yeah, I, I watched it. And uh, I, w I was not super impressed. If, if you were impressed by the fact that he was uh, pretty mild in his temperament, then I guess you have a pretty low bar. But it certainly didn't say anything crazy, which... Um, if, you know, if that impressed you, then great. Why were you not impressed? Because I'll tell you, you know, I, I, I thought he did a pretty good job. Um, and maybe I do have that low bar here, Spencer, because he's been so off the wall and a lot of stuff, you know, that he comes on. I think about an hour interview on 60 Minutes. I'm like, why is he going to say? And he didn't say anything to put his foot in his mouth. So, I mean, maybe that was the low bar. And I'll also tell you the S&P futures. I looked at them when 60 Minutes started. We were trading up about a point. When 60 Minutes was over, we were up about 10 points. I don't think that was a coincidence. I think the market thought he did an okay job here, too. What were you not impressed about? Oh, well, okay. So, first of all, he did say he was going to – uh, he loves Twitter, but he's, he's going to rein in his uh, his Twitter uh, commentary. Uh, that, that's what he said. But then right after that, he tweet, he tweeted, or right before the segment, he tweeted. Uh, obviously, this was taped on Friday. He tweeted that the New York Times was uh, you know dishonest and lying about them. And I mean, just <laughs> all, 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 all the policy questions were either a dodge or a or yeah. a uh, or a you know sort of a. Changing, changing his mind. I mean, you know, the whole Obamacare thing. How he said how impressed he was with Obama and how Obama was so smart. Like, oh, that's great insight there. You just figured that one out. And yeah, he's gonna be, you know, his, his, on his website it still says one of his top policies is gonna be to repeal Obamacare. But then he said on on the show he's gonna, you know, just keep certain things. Uh, you know, keep parts of it. Yeah, parts of it. And uh, just he seemed to kind of walk back on everything that all his policies that he's discussed during the during the uh, campaign, which is fine. So I guess rather like you have to either look at it as either he like meant everything he said or he meant nothing that he said, you know? I mean, it's it's kind of one or the other in my opinion. But it, he just seemed to me like he didn't really know what he was doing with regards to policy, which, you know, I sh is not news, but I, I just came away as he, he, he looked very overwhelmed to me. Yeah, I thought his kids did a good job too, though. Oh. Like when they came oh. on there, like the one daughter, very well oh, spoken. Oh, oh my God, Ivanka is so well spoken. Holy, well spoken. Holy cow! I, she is, she's had some media training because she, she came off as very, very well polished. Uh, but, yeah. but uh, I mean, it, 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 the whole thing just is is, is bizarre and. Uh, the the policy questions, uh, while not they weren't even. He did deep. dodge them. I agree with you. He yeah, they, they weren't even. But deep. he has done that the whole campaign. Yeah, and they weren't even deep questions. He, but he just, you know, he walked his way around them, and yeah. I don't know, man. I, well, I mean, it, it could have gone worse. <laughs> it could have gone a whole lot worse, but didn't do. That's a, whole... a victory for Trump, and when he's in the public media, isn't it? <laughs> but but he didn't do anything didn't to. Put the foot in the mouth. It didn't do any, uh, you know, anything. Someone like me, like you know, I. For, so he so he's president. Great. I now I've I've moved on now and I'm I'm all that. Okay. So what's he gonna do for the country? Because you know he's in charge. He it, it didn't do anything to to kind of uh, you know calm my fears of he doesn't know what he's doing. So that's my thing. In any regard here, market did get a little bit of pop on it there, and then it pulled back. We're popping here again, Joel. I mean, I'm still seeing the same separation that I continue to see the TLT getting hit hard here again today. Actually, TLT's bounced back. You know, it's funny. Okay, well, here we go. You know, we're getting a little bit of bounce in the t in the bonds here. Oh, I, so, actually, I actually want to add. I want to add one thing. He's he tweeted that the New York Times is losing thousands of uh, thousands of subscribers, which is blatantly not true. Yeah, so. he needs to stop like tweeting against the media, like the mass media, and that's just what he wants to do. Is obviously keep tweeting in there, and he <laughs> he's putting you know that t tweets like that does put the foot in the mouth. Just stay back you know and you know obviously they got to rein him in here a little bit here but i think they're going to be able to do it i think once he's in there i don't think he's going to be this crazy tweeter that's going to be just putting his foot in his mouth all the time i mean he's going to continue to put his foot in his mouth but i think they're going to bring down the number of instances that he does that 
Certainly. Joel, what are your thoughts on all this? I'm, I'm, back. I'm just, just, just going to sit back and let uh, all you guys t talk politics. <laughs> no more politics. Yeah, no it. more politics. Uh, tired. You guys have tired me out, but uh, it's uh, 8.54 S&P. We're reversing. I, yeah. I, I just want to say before we even do that, we are seeing a little bit of a reversal here in some of the defensive stocks. They were down when we were talking about 20 minutes ago. The XLU is trying to come back here this morning here. And if I'm looking at my screen, some of these defensive stocks are actually trying to bounce back here a little bit this morning. So that's something to think about here if you are trading uh, those defensive stocks. Again, a little bit of a bounce, although we saw that Friday and the bounce was faded. So it all depends on, I guess what the market does here if they're going to fade those bounces once again you got to be careful with these trends though because they can be pesky and they've been pesky for three days all right uh, let's talk about the disaster stock of the day here dynavax technologies close uh was up in the 11 dollar handle now trading under three dollars well you did hit 295 and getting a little bit of a bounce here what do we have on what stock is that I didn't have that one. DV. What's the symbol natural? DVAX. Spencer, what, I got are we, it. what are we? What's the bad news on DVAX? Yep. Hold on one second. Sorry, I was doing other stuff. Uh, DVAX is down following an announcement of uh, CRL from uh, the FDA. It's a response letter for their hepatitis B drug. Uh, not a good one uh, at that. Uh, but anytime. Uh, you see, you see a move. Uh, the response letter is is the bad news from from their happy drug, uh, which is a CRL. All right, pre market low two ninety five, getting a little bit of a bounce on that. We've seen how some of these stocks, uh, you know, get a big reversal. Sometimes your your bulls come in here, or excuse me, your bears come in to cover, and uh, happening a little bit, but. Uh, yeah, well, where is those reversals bounce from, too? I mean, you could have said that at 7, 6, 5, 4, 3. I mean, when it was going straight down, I think that's maybe the big point to make here is when you're trying to buy these things that are going straight down, wait for them to stabilize, even the pre-market. At least it's stabilized here now. We put in a low, a 295. You know, it takes that out. At least you have an out. You know where your out is. I mean, if I was buying this thing, you know, just talking potential trade setups here, If and, and I don't like buying a stock ever that's down 72% because I'm a big fan of momentum. But, you know, if you're a good bounce trader, I know Ace is an excellent bounce trader there in the chat. Wait till stops going down. That's something you taught me, Joel, back, you know, 17 years ago there. Because when you start, you know, just trying to call the bottom and trying to say, oh, well, it's gone down too far at seven bucks. It's got to be bounce here eventually. Well, the bounce might happen. <laughs> didn't happen at six, didn't happen at five, didn't happen at four. We can forget about seven. Seven's off the table probably now here because the thing's 320. And what people don't realize, for the stock to go back to seven bucks, that's got over double from this price. So the people who are buying it here now in big volume, they're going to be coming in here and getting in your way. And that's why the stock just can't easily bounce back. So I like to wait for the stocks to stop going down before I just start jumping in and trying to pick the bottom. Uh, two things we'll address before we wrap up the show. Echo graph. Seriously, though, what pharma stocks, you know, for anti-depression, anxiety, depression, or potential gainers post-election? I guess the only thing I have to say uh, that is that these drug companies that do have these anti I mean it's a it's a, a small part of that some of them is just a small part of their business so it's like it's hard to make an implication just because it's you know Xanax or whatever the other anti depression drugs are that it's going to be just great for one individual stop stock uh, Dennis any comments on that uh I, I'm not going to try to speculate on what pharmaceutical. I, yeah. I don't know if we're all going to get depressed here. I mean, <laughs> you, you have a lot of people who are scared. You know, there was jokes in you know, the Canadian. Well, actually, I guess the Canadian immigration site did go down after Trump got in here. So is the world really that scared that they're going to start taking more drugs and stuff to, to deal with the Trump presidency? I don't think so. Kinda, yeah. I think, you know, it's it's nervousness right now. But people will stop and think irrationally about it. And I mean, the market, just you know, the market's the best indicator of this, of everything. You know, the initial reaction was, what? Trump is in? Kill the S&P futures. And they came down selling it down 100 handles. And that was, you know, that initial reaction, the initial fear of what are we getting ourselves into? Now you stop and you think, okay, well, you know, it's not going to just be like Trump's going to go fight with the whole world, cause World War Three here, change everything, kick every, you know, minority out of the country. It's not going to happen. And I think even when he was talking, you know, on, you know, 60 Minutes, that's the one thing that I got comfort in here a little bit there. I know, you know, what he says on 60 Minutes might be different than what he thinks in real life. But he was saying, you know, that, you know, that they were going to start even when they were looking at illegal immigrants. They were going to start looking at criminals, people with criminal records, people you probably don't want in your country. He wasn't. And then he was going to say we're going to 
analyze other illegal immigrants after that. But he was even saying a lot of the illegal immigrants that are in the country are good people. Trump said that on 60 Minutes, and that was comforting to me, you know, and I'm not saying I'm a fan of illegal immigrants, but he's not just going to start throwing everybody in cuffs, you know, and if you don't have your paperwork dotted your I's and cross your T's, you're kicked out of the country here. So, you know, that's, you know, one consideration is I think they're already reining him in, and it's only been, you know, that was on Friday, that was, that was taped, that was only two days. You know, you give this guy, give him some time, give the Republican Party some time with him, and they will polish Trump up, and I don't think it's going to be the end of the world. Let me uh, just quick comments here. I've been patient on Tesla. Stock got hit, you know, off the uh, off the new, um, new term president coming in. I've just never been a fan of this stock. 180 looks like a major support level, but it seems like every time this thing, you know, gives you a fake out one way or another, it turns around 180.42. We're bounced up there, but I mean, just I guess the longer it takes to get back over 200, uh, the more chance you're just going to fall on that 180 level. Dennis, any final comments on Tesla? Uh, no comments here on Tesla. It's a stock that you know I think is just. It's broken here slightly. I think, you know, below 200, I think the bears are still in control on this one here. And there's been that rotation from some of these higher growth stocks into some of your classic, you know, um, some of your, obviously there's been a lot of rotation we've talked about a long time, but I think Tesla's not been a benefit, a beneficiary of that rotation here. So I'm hands off on the long side on Tesla. Okay. Spencer, you want to wrap up the show? Windows yeah, I, I was going to add more on the Trump thing, but I'm, I'm not going to now. I'm, I, I know. <laughs> you know what? Spencer, I going to play with <laughs> just, just, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. Okay, uh, if you missed any part of our show today, including our chat with Jamie, you can catch the whole thing again uh, on YouTube. It's recorded uh, live, actually, or you can catch the podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Stitcher. Just search for Benzinga or Premarket. Also, a quick reminder to check out Benzinga Pro. It's Benzinga's real-time news platform that's great for anybody who wants to stay on top of what's going on with the markets. You can get a free two-week trial today by going to pro.benzinga.com or calling us up at 313 723 2000 on tomorrow's show where we've got Nick Shaheen on as we do every Tuesday so we're looking forward to that and the last thing please always remember that all the information material and content from our show is for informational purposes only and not meant to be investing advice 901 we're going to let you go now hope everybody has a good rest of your day and we will see you guys again tomorrow morning whether you're a short-term swing trader or a long-term investor, you need to check out Thinkorswim, brought to you by TD Ameritrade. There's a reason why Thinkorswim has been named the number one trading platform, because it has it all. With Thinkorswim, you can trade stocks, options, futures, forex, and virtually every other type of order. Get notifications on mobile devices and interact with other traders in chat rooms. You can also use technical indicators and see the latest investing and trading education in Think Money magazine. If you want to keep up with the markets, you need Thinkorswim. To experience everything Thinkorswim has to offer, open a TD Ameritrade account today. Thinkorswim, the online trading platform for traders and investors. TD Ameritrade, member SIPC. All investing involves risks.